Good morning. Today is the 21st day of Cheshvan, the 5th of November. And we're starting a new parsha today, Parashat Chaye Sarah, which means the life of Sarah, which ironically begins with Sarah dying. And there's a lot spoken about that. Why would we call a parsha that uh, begins with uh, a person's uh, demise uh, the life of that person? The simple explanation is, of course, that um, as we read in the uh, Daily Tanya uh, last week, that a tzaddik, when he, a, a soul of a pious person, when he departs or she departs the world, uh, begins to influence the world much more than during their lifetime. And that is because during their lifetime the soul was limited to the uh, expression it could get through the body and now that it has departed all the good deeds and all the loving kindness that it ushered into the world are no longer limited and can be distributed openly in the entire world. What we want to look at today is a very interesting correspondence between the first five parashot, the first five Torah portions of the book of Genesis with the first five verses of Genesis. The first five verses, if you recall, are the first day, are the account of the first day of creation in which we hear about in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and then the earth was chaotic and void. And then we find that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters and then God says, let there be light, and there was light. Then in the fourth verse, he separates between the light and the darkness. In the fifth verse, he calls the light day, and the darkness he named night. It was evening, and it was morning, one day. So let's see how this correspondence works. In the beginning, Bereshit obviously corresponds to the first portion, which is called Bereshit itself which describes the beginning of the world, the beginning of what came out, Toldot Shemaim Va'aretz, means these are the um, output, as it were, the results that came out of the creation of the heavens and the earth, the way it's described uh, in a very parallel verse in chapter 4. We actually saw this a few weeks ago. Then the earth was chaotic and void, Obviously, this relates to Noah. And Noah is also a bit of a revelation of godliness already. And that's what the verse, the second verse includes. The Spirit of God hovered, was hovering over the waters. It's like the ark of the, uh, Noah's ark that was hovering over the waters and saving uh, life from the flood. The third verse corresponds to Lech Lecha. And we said that the third verse is when God creates light. That obviously is the discovery of Abraham. And that light that Abraham is himself and is the faith in one God that he uh, publicizes around the globe. The fourth verse is Vayera. And in Vayera we hear about the birth of Yishmael. And there's a separation that has to happen there. The separation in the fourth verse of the Torah is God separated between the light and the darkness. And in Parashat Vayera, the fourth parsha, we have a separation between Sarah and her son Isaac and Hagar, Yishmael's mother, and Yishmael from Avraham's family. So we have a case of separation. But then we have the fifth and final verse of the first day, which we said is, God called the light day, and the darkness he named night, and it was evening and it was morning one day. This is supposed to co- correspond to our parsha, Chaye Sarah. And let's see how, because this is a little bit more complex to explain. When Avraham comes to bury Sarah, he needs to purchase a plot of land. This is not something that he had until then. He didn't possess any of the land of the any of the land 
of the land of Canaan at the time. So he needs to purchase it. Avram does something quite incredible. He mints coins. And on these, and he uses these coins, each one, he actually minted four coins. That's the description in the Talmud. He minted four coins, each one worth a hundred shekels of silver, which was a certain weight. And he gave them to Ephron, the Hittite, for his plot of land that included the cave of the Machpelah, the cave where, uh, according to the tradition, Adam and Eve were buried, and according and which now Abraham used to bury Sarah, and later on all the patriarchs and matriarchs except for Rachel would be buried in. What is his idea of minting coins? So we learn in uh, in the, the Talmud that there are two signs for being a king. Well, there's actually a few of them, but the most important one that really tells us if someone is a king, if someone has the authority of being a sovereign, is whether or not they can mint coins. And this is an incredible idea. Because when you mint a coin, what are you actually doing? And I believe we've talked about this in the past, that when you mint a coin, what you're actually doing is you're ensuring, you're giving your seal of approval that this coin includes the amount of silver or gold that it's purported to. In other words, what's to, t what's to stop someone from saying to someone else, here's a hundred shekels weight of silver, and to hand him over 75? Not everybody can tell, especially when they're light coins, not everybody can tell. And what they used to do in ancient times was they used to sort of rape, uh, scrape them off and remove filings of silver and gold off of coins. The whole point of minting a coin was that you knew for certain that this coin included that exact amount of silver or gold as it was supposed to. And the way that someone insured it, and let's, we'll understand in a moment what it means by insured it, was that they put, the king put his, the bust of his, of his face or some other symbol that was related to him on the coin itself when it was minted so that everybody would know that he's placing himself behind the currency. What did it mean that he insured it? Exactly what it used to mean when the do dollar bill, for instance, was connected to the gold standard. And so you could come with a dollar bill, and you could come to a bank in the Federal Reserve System, and they theoretically were supposed to give you your money's worth in gold. And that same idea was started by Abraham, who we say was the first king. We saw this in uh, the previous uh, um, Parsha, in the previous portion of, of Lech Lecha, after he fought the, um, the war with the uh, four kings, he was crowned himself to be the king of all the areas in the land of Canaan. And so what he did was he ensured his money. And if someone had a problem, somebody had shaved it off, somebody had done something else to it, then Abraham would make up for it. Why did Abraham do this? So we actually, I think we talked about this at the end of last week, for the same reason that Abraham dug wells. He dug the wells and he minted coin that could be counted on because he wanted to advance commerce. Because it's a very simple thing that civilization depends on commerce. And commerce depends on freedom to travel, the security in travel, the fact that someone could have money and water that they could count on when traveling. And Abraham was trying to build civilization. And I think we even talked about this in the distant past, that by making a currency, by making it possible for people to conduct business with security. They knew that what they were giving was what they thought they were giving. They knew that what they were getting was what they thought they were getting. He increased the trust between people. And when you increase the trust, when you increase faith between people, you also increase the 
acknowledgement that God is one. Because the only way to really acknowledge that God is one when there's so many diverse people here on earth is when there is peace and security between them. And that was what Abraham was trying to foster. So because of that, he was the first one to mint a coin. We also mentioned, uh, I believe, in these classes a long time ago, that the moment that you make a coin, and you don't just say, well, um, let's barter. The moment you make money and created a metaphor for value, you've created a symbol for value, you're not exchanging a chicken for a duck, you're not exchanging one cow for a donkey or something like that. What you're beginning to see is that, that wealth can be infinite and that begins to introduce the notion of an infinite God into the mind. So that when we think about the number infinite, the, or the infinity itself, we actually have something to, to, to work with. We can imagine very, very large numbers, which they weren't able to do before there was money, because you could only imagine so many chickens, you could only imagine so many um, cows, if only for the reason that just to take care of them, would take an infinite amount of time and long before you'd get to an infinite number of cows or chickens or donkeys or whatever it was. But when you talk about money, you can stockpile theoretically as much as you want and you can get a notion of value that is infinite. So that was uh, something that Abraham wanted to do. Now how does this tie into the fifth verse of the first day of creation where we said that God named the day, uh, the light day, and the darkness he named night, and it was one day, together they became one day, the, the, the day and the night, because what did Abraham mint on his coins? So the Talmud says, on one side he had the figure of an old man and an old woman, and on the back side of the coin he had a figure of a young man and a young woman. These four figures were supposed to symbolize Abraham and Sarah, the old couple, and on the back were Isaac and Rebekah, the young couple. Why? Because it was a because Abraham and Sarah were becoming old. There was another thing that Abraham wanted to create, which was continuity in education, meaning that he and his wife were now passing on the sovereignty they were giving an inheritance, a spiritual inheritance, to their offspring, to Isaac and Rebekah. That was the whole point of the money. The money is supposed to create a connection between the generations. A lot of times um, we don't understand the meaning of inheritance. We think that inheritance is an easy way to get money, but what it's really meant to do is to create cohesion between the generations. It's meant to connect us to each other. So it's true that it's a very external way of doing it, but yet and yet it works because people have a tendency to even come to terms uh, with their parents, even if they don't agree on many things, just because of this thing called an inheritance. And it's an incredible idea that you inherit the wealth of your parents, creating a continuity in human education and human advancement in development and so that is the notion of it was day and it was night one day meaning that there is a generation that's going off into the night it's finishing its uh, its purpose here on earth but there's a new generation coming out of the day they're called the day and together they're one together they create the continuity that makes up human life so thank you very much for joining Hope to see you tomorrow.